Thanks for having me out. Hello, friends, and welcome to another Robcast. We are in the back house with Scott Reynolds. Scott, hey, welcome. Man. It's his first time in the back house. I love it here. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, my friends, uh, just just hang on because we're gonna go. We're gonna go into this man's life, and we're, he's gonna take us into all sorts of places. Look at me; I'm like hyping you up already. <laughs> so I remember you telling me you're living in the Midwest, Michigan. Yes. And your early twenties. Yep. And you go to the mo- You go to the theater. I go to the theater. To uh, a friend of mine was a manager there, and so he would have me go with him to just go watch Prince Thursday night. You know, they check the prints before the Friday showing. Oh, to make sure that the, make sure the that reel's good. good or whatever. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend Patrick. And, uh, and I saw the movie that sort of changed the trajectory of my life, for sure. Which was? Which was Pulp Fiction. And <laughs> what were you doing before that? Before, when, I, was, when, I was going to college. You know, I, I, I went the long route for college. I went to like a little Christian college in Tennessee for a bit, thinking I wanted to be a youth pastor. Or, <laughs> you know, and then I thought maybe I want to work... I wanted to work with youth as a, a youth probation officer. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then I got in a lot of trouble, and they eventually kicked me out of that school. And I worked just like, just like in Flashdance. I worked in a metal <laughs> shop for a year, except I wasn't a dancer. <laughs> just like in Flashdance. <laughs> yeah. So you see Pulp Fiction, and what happens? Uh, I see Pulp Fiction, and I say... I, I, for, I had seen Reservoir Dogs on video. Mm-hmm. Like a little before, and I was like, "Who is this guy, Quentin Tarantino? This is this speaks to me on a level that I can't even comprehend. I just I fixated on him. Like I I could have I I I read in that at that time in the '90s, there was lots of books coming out, lots of articles, lots of interviews, and I I had clippings. I was like a stalker. I was flat out a Tarantino stalker. Uh, Something about the way this man told stories. Yes. The the. Music, visual, characters, dialogue, Just everything, perfect art at its. And for me, art at its apex. And you've yeah. never seen anything like it. I'd never. What's weird about it is like, yeah, I'd never seen anything like it, but it all is so familiar too, right? I mean, that's sort of what he does. This sort of homage to the things that he loves and the things that I love. Right. But, uh, yeah, it spoke to me. I was like going to college at Eastern Michigan, and I was like an English lit major and a theater minor and a film studies minor, you know, all those like those things that you just sort of do to do and you don't know what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yes. Russian lit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, and I saw that and I went, uh, I went to my girlfriend at that time, Amy, who I was now my wife. And I, after that movie, I, I, I woke up the next day, the next day. Uh, I don't even think I went to class the next day. And I went to her and I said, I'm going to move to California. I'm going to pursue this dream. Cause here's this guy that, didn't go to even go to film school or anything. He just had a love of film and a love of story, and that and uh, and he went for it, you know. And I was like, I have to. And even though I was scared of, you know, earthquakes, <laughs> which is crazy, right? Because in the Midwest, you're from the Midwest. Yeah. Uh, there's tornadoes and all sorts of terrible there's things that happen all the time. Lots of ways to die everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I went to her and I was like. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to, and I would love you to go with me, which means you got to marry me. Uh, will you really? marry me? <laughs> it's like that. And that all happened fairly quickly. Very quickly. I, yeah. I need to go do this. This now, is what, what I need to what do. Now, what kind of, were you, were, did you, were you raised in a home where this was like, yeah, go after your dreams, make things? What, what were no. you? No. Yeah, I, I was very, you know, my dad is awesome, and he's, he's old school, sort of quiet, uh, whenever people meet my dad, they're always like, who is this guy? Does he like me? <laughs> that, you know, it's that kind of Midwest sort of guy. Um, wasn't very happy that I was an English lit major because what are you going to do with that? Yeah. Um, my mom was on her way to becoming a pastor at that point. Uh, my dad was always like the best friend of the pastors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sort mm-hmm. of thing. So we went to church all the time. But, but in spite of that, it was very, very nuts and bolts. Like... Yeah, pragmatism. Pragmatism. Classic. Like have something. Have a backup plan. Have a save backup some money. Plan. Sensible, rational, yeah, yeah. pragmatic. Don't move to California <laughs> with the woman you just married a week ago. I mean, I knew her for a while. I knew her for a while yeah. before that. But uh, with uh, twelve hundred dollars in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> so you mo- did you know anybody? I how- knew one person. It was that guy Patrick, who was the 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 manager of the movie theater in Ypsilanti. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, yipsy tucky. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so and if somebody said, why are you moving? Did you say, I'm going to Hollywood? What, what was yes. your answer? I said, I'm going to Hollywood to write. And at that point, I, sort of, I was sort of into acting a little bit too. Um, terrible decision. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I had a screenplay in my <clears throat> hand that I, that, I, that I wrote shortly after watching Pulp Fiction that was like semi-autobiographical, but not you really. You just but, yeah. figured out how to write screenplays. Yes, from watching, because I didn't take any classes on that. I didn't really do anything. Yeah. To this day, you haven't had any classes. On screenwriting, no. By the way, friends, when you see where this interview goes, that is actually really, really interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you come out, and what happens? Uh, nothing. <laughs> I, co I come out, I move to the valley, we, and we live in this area of the valley, it's like 95, so in this area of the valley that still, uh, was that the, the, North, the North Ridge earthquake? Mm -hmm. Still apartment buildings falling apart. <laughs> you, it, looked, wait, wait, it was scary. Wait. Your first thought was I could move to California, but there are earthquakes. And then you move right near the <laughs> epicenter right. of yeah. the recent most w worst <laughs> With constant reminders all With over With constant reminders all around you of earthquakes. <laughs> yeah, but I had the screenplay in my hand about, it was called Liquored, about college students that rob liquor stores to make, to make money for college, basically. Is this what you did? No, but uh, no, but it was about my life, you know, okay. it was about my life in college and all that. But I didn't rob liquor stores. I didn't rob liquor stores. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for the record, <laughs> yes, just to make yeah, it clear. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're taking. So how do you, are you calling people? Or are you? I, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I didn't know any. All I knew was from what I read about Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> um, so I got a job in a bookstore. And it's had that books and in, in uh, Studio City. It's, it's one of the ones that's still open, actually, Bookstar in Studio City. And uh, I worked there. I worked in the film and TV section, and I talked to because it's right near the Radford lot, the CBS Radford lot. So every time anybody came in that had anything to do with anything, I latched onto them and t tried to get a job. I was probably really annoying. <laughs> uh, passed my screenplay to people, and nothing. Not a not a. Actually, you know, I had I had one company some some production company that was doing a chainsaw movie with, uh, I even forget the actor's name, the, 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 act, the big actor in it was the guy from Raising Arizona on the motorcycle, the, motor, the ex-football player. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Not Brian, uh, I'll think of it. Yeah, this is why we have the internet. You know. And exactly. And nothing the, happened with that either. The Googler. So are you desperate? Are you in despair? Are you just incredibly hopeful because you're young? What? I was, uh, I was oddly incredibly hopeful. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, that is the beautiful thing about Los Angeles that I really do and why I love it so much is that it feels like anything can happen here at any moment, at any time. If you keep moving forward, and maybe it's like this young Gen X, or this Gen X point of view, but if you keep moving forward, something amazing can happen at any time. You don't know what it may be. But uh, so you're 24, 25, 25, 26. 26. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't know anybody. Get this, and I'm working retail. My wife, then my wife actually, she she gets a she was in she had an interior design set up, but she got into production design, and so she actually was getting on different shows, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> still working in a bookstore. <laughs> and and your like, wife mm. is working. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not you know nothing makes you feel like a man. <laughs> And when you come home with your, you know, minimum wage retail bookstore. <laughs> and your wife is literally on film and TV shoots. She's actually, and I would go visit her. She was on Freaks and Geeks. So I, I would go, which was an amazing show. I would yeah. go visit her as often as on possible. On the Freaks and Geeks set. Yeah. And then, t then what happens? Um, then I get a job at another bookstore. They transfer me and they want to make me a manager. Because <laughs> I'm good, you know, like I give, whatever I do, I give my all. Um, and I, and, and, uh, not to get like too like Christian-y or whatever, but, um, one of the things that sort of gave me hope all the time also was like, wherever I was, I knew I was there for a reason probably. Yeah. And, uh, and what, no matter how much of a failure I was at it, like trying to be the, the proof of God wherever I was, gave me a sense of mission. Even yeah. when I was filing books in the self-help right. section. Right, right. <laughs> So you had um, some sense like this is all, this, just, just keep going. Keep going, it's keep all, writing. It's all going to work out. And uh, it didn't really for like seven years. Whoa. Yeah. Seven years of working like retail and then working for like an educational production house. 
making cold calls <laughs> to teachers so that they would want to. Uh, uh, but and then at night, going home and writing. You know, writing the next, trying to find that next, trying to get that next idea, that next screen movie that that was going to be my Tarantino moment, and uh, that you know didn't quite happen. I was doing like a lot of stuff. Uh, it's going like mosaic, so I was doing a lot of art stuff there, which helped a little bit, but nothing uh, until my wife was working with somebody. I, ha I have this like. I love movies. I love movies. They are, they are. I used to feel guilty because I like watching them so much, but I've sort of come to the conclusion that that's where I recharge and re-energize and mm -hmm. dream big. And um, but I have this like thing for black exploitation movies. Like I love them. They're the most honest and pure movies. How would you out there. explain this genre? It is black exploitation. Uh, black exploitation movies in from the seventies, and they're Tarantino's favorite also. But it's this. Uh, boom of movies in the 70s about uh, black inner city life. Uh, and they were, you know, the man is the bad guy. Sure, and sure. Uh, their private eyes or their, you know, there's, there's one called Black Shampoo where they're, they're hairstylists, you know, coming up against the mob. Uh, and there are these tropes and sort of arc that just keep replaying yes. throughout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'd seen all, almost all of them at this point. And my wife was working on a show where there was a, this guy Vikram Jianti was doing a who did um, when we were kings. Did you see that documentary when we were kings? Yes, amazing, right? Yeah. Um, so he and Reggie Hudlin were doing a, uh, a documentary about black exploitation movies, and my wife was working with the wife of Vikram or the girlfriend of Vikram Jianti, and she's like, "Oh, my husband knows all about this." So I met with them, and that was my first like uh, industry job. I was the white boy black exploitation uh, researcher expert. expert. Yeah. <laughs> so I was getting all this stuff together and it was going to be this documentary for TNT, I think, or TBS or TNT. And ultimately, as it happens in this business, uh, nothing came of it. We went down this trail the day before they were about to start shooting and uh, I think TBS or TNT were sort of like, you know, this is really black. Where's the white guys? <laughs> well. But it was a job it was in... a dream, yeah. And then where do you go? From there, I get on a show that made my parents very happy, uh, Touched by an Angel. No <laughs> yes. way. I did not know this. <laughs> yeah. Seasons eight and nine. What? As a writing it? assistant slash script coordinator, <laughs> which basically means I sit in a room with all these writers and I uh, take down as verbatim as possible everything they're talking about all day long. And at the end of the day, assemble it into something that makes sense, that drives us forward into the next day, uh, uh, assembling it into you a sense of story. got yeah. a job on Touched by an Angel. <laughs> yes. My grandparents were so happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not you, Tarantino. For people who aren't familiar with a writer's room, <laughs> yeah, most and pretty industry standard, most shows have, would have how many writers? Uh, anywhere between five and 15 depending on the show. Like, I think Ooh. comedies have a lot more. And This one, I think, had seven. So these are the eights. writers. Then you have writer's assistants who yep. are basically recording everything that happens in the room. Re recording it, typing it up, and assembling. And then everybody shows up 9 to 9-ish, nine 9 to 5-ish, whatever to, that is. 10 to 6. 10 to yep. 6. And pick up where they left off. Yep. And you break down a story. This yep. happens, then this happens. But then somebody within the writing room gets assigned to actually write it up. That's right. That's right. So when you see a TV show and it says written by so and so, that person is actually generally part of a writer's room. Yep. Definitely. And they're all take turn taking turns actually generally speaking. getting writing credit. Yes. Who decides who of all the people around the table gets each episode? Uh, you know, sort of, yeah, the showrunners. Just it's sort of random. Like you just, we we just figured out even before. So uh, I've been lucky that a lot of times I've gotten episodes on shows that I've written that connect with me in a deeper way than, than I ever could have. But a lot of times, you just get a, you know... You just get you're doing number nine. eight. And oh, you don't yeah. know what number eight is yet at the top of the top of the year, you know? So a writer's... And everybody's pitching ideas for this scene, this is where it could go, this character could do this. In between a lot of fart jokes <laughs> and, you know, what happened with your wife this morning. And what, what's great about the writer's room, what I love is that it is so... There's a certain, hopefully, that when it's working well, there's a certain amount of safety in it that you can 
say because people are sharing all yes. kinds of stuff from their past, from yeah. their relationships. You draw a story from your life. So yeah. when, so when people listening to this watch whatever there is their their favorite show, their Netflix, yeah. their whatever, that began with a group of people around a table Just, telling about what they had for breakfast and what their kid did last night and yeah. what's happening with their parent, whatever it is, and then uh, flashes of story <laughs> that that sort of happened here and there. Yeah. And moments where everybody goes, yes, yes, kill her. Put that on a board. <laughs> or yes, get him fired. Or yeah. yes, blow up the building or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And it's amazing and fun. When it works, uh, it is the greatest time. It's the greatest times of my life. When is the first... So you got on Touched by an Angel, which is a writer's room. Yep. Is that a compelling writer's room? Is that interesting? Is that just... What's that writer? That's your first experience yeah, in the writer's yeah. room. You know, I mean, let's face it. That's not my cup of tea necessarily. <laughs> you know, like the, uh, the basic plot of a Touch by an Angel episode is there's a guy who is drinking too much and uh, uh, not paying attention to his kid, let's say. Um, and uh, so God sends a pair of angels or three angels to work undercover in his life. And suddenly <laughs> this guy's going to a bookstore. And a coffee shop where Roma Downey Jr. works and where, you know, all these other <laughs> angels are working undercover. And they're sitting there going, hey, you know, uh, Rob, you should quit drinking so much. Hey, Rob, you know, you're ignoring little Timmy Timmy, yeah. oh, much too much. You really should pay more attention to him. And then, you know, of course, Rob ignores everything that they're saying until the angels finally get fed up and they light up. <laughs> and they go, we're angels. Listen to us. Come on. And the guy cries. Did, and then he changes his life. <laughs> did you ever in the writer's room say to another writer, that is the cheesiest idea I've ever heard? Uh, later, I felt like I could say that, yes. But, oh, really? Yeah, but at yeah. first, you're at just first, you're so just, excited. You're excited. Like anybody, you also got to know your place. You, know, yeah. you don't want to walk in and go, Prr. This is the dumbest. Because you're <laughs> like, I am in, I'm in the game now. I'm in the game. That's right. Then Touched by an Angel raps. It raps. And you go on. I go on. What happened then? I think I, 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 I uh, the next show I got on, uh, what was the next show I got on? I got on like a Fox show that was about the porn industry. Uh, Touched by an angel <laughs> to a show about the porn industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then what? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, and that was interesting. You know uh, what? You know why I find this interesting is for everybody who's like, ah, all everybody else, their work was a nice, clean trajectory, but I feel like I bounced all around. Yes. You're, what you are describing is so universal in its particular. Yeah. Like I was here, then I was here, then that didn't work out. Yeah. Then I worked on that thing, and then at the last minute they pulled the plug. It's like... Which happens in television all the time. It's almost like, it's like there's this... Long, slow, like I feel like with my life, this long, slow trajectory that I also felt like I was falling down a flight of stairs often. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's going somewhere, kind of, but it's also where, what are we do? What is yeah. this? Yeah, yeah, you come home at the end of the night and go, what? Yeah, you won't believe what I did today. Right. This was progress. <laughs> this was like steps back. <laughs> yeah. And then you end up. I end up working with uh, Clyde Phillips. Who was? He's this guy that uh, I think he said Lee Susan. I think was the one. But he later he became he got on Dexter. He became the showrunner of Dexter. But at this point he was not the showrunner of Dexter. He had sold some pilots t to you know different. That's like a first channels. episode. A first episode. A first yeah, yeah. Of a show. And so I I worked with him like as his assistant, writing, helping him create these these worlds and these scripts, and uh, it was like film school, the best film school ever, really, basically. And it was uh, a blast. It was a blast. It was really good. Like, I actually, like, went and lived with him in Connecticut, uh, which was tough on my family, because at that point, yeah. I had a wife and a kid. <laughs> yeah. And another kid on the way. But Amy, God bless her, like, believed in all of this and believed in me. And as hard as it was, uh, it, it was, it was, it was great. So and none of those, none of those sold. And then I got on a show called uh, E Ring, which is the Bruckheimer show. And I thought, oh, God, I'm on a Bruckheimer oh, show. Jerry Bruckheimer, this that's can't like lose, big, right? right? Yeah, that's big time. And it was about um, special ops, but about the guys that control special ops. You know, like full. <laughs> and so I'm working with this guy, uh, Ken, who's the like, creator of it, who actually went and did all the stuff we're talking about. Like he was the real deal. <laughs> the real deal guy that was in charge of special ops for all these years. So his stories were amazing. And, uh, but I was a writing assistant on that. 
but I listened to his stories and figured out how to make those stories oh in episodes yeah. yeah in episodes and so they that's the first show I became like a writer a staff writer was that an unbelievably I mean that moment oh yeah I thought I thought I thought I made it I thought oh, this is it here I go finally after that was seven years after seven years of the grind and when you live in LA um you move out here with a lot of people that have a lot that are trying to fulfill yes. their dreams and 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 a lot of them, after about five years, five, six years, if it doesn't work out, they, they leave. They go it's, back home. Like, I was losing all my friends. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I just did this event where a woman in the front row, she said, I'm an actress. Yeah. And I've been going to auditions for so many years, and nothing's happening. When do you just stop and go home? Yeah. My answer would be, you don't. If this is what you right, want to do. Right, right, right. Like you did, I didn't have, it's that thing that my, that you were saying about my dad, that like, I didn't, I didn't have a backup plan at all. Nothing. It was this, was it. this or, or bust, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which is, you know, I it was tough. It. Like the, we were broker than broke. There were times when like on my birthday, our car was broken. Uh, Amy and I rode our bikes over to in and out and split a meal. <laughs> we were like that broke for my birthday. That was like our. And we're living and, it up. But she believed. She believed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I believed. And Absolutely. her belief helped my belief. I think a lot. And she was also work. work I mean, has become this amazing designer. But yeah, she was also going after her stuff. Yeah, totally. Yep, yep. We were both out here. And then, De and then you end up in the writing room. At some point, you end up in the writing room on Dexter. Yes. So, 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 yeah. So I get an E ring. Yep. And. It gets canceled. Like I, I'm, a, I'm a writer on it, but I think it's going to be great. I'm going to march forward, and then I can't get I can't get an interview with a showrunner. My agents can't get me anywhere because I'm just the you know. There's plenty of white dudes You're that do just this job, guy. and I'm right. just a staff writer. Um, and so Clyde calls me up and he says, "Hey Scott, our writing our writing assistant uh, is is having a lot of anxiety about this show because you know I mean Dexter is about a serial killer who, who kills." Who, yeah. Serial killers who kills bad people, people who got bad away people. with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who got away with bad things, um, and he's not. And you know, some people look at him like he's a vigilante, like he's a super, like he's a superhero. Is he Batman? But he's really like a super messed up person who is reacting to the tragedy of his life. Of his life, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Wait, and the writer's assistant had a problem with the themes. The yeah, plot? it was just yeah because you have to, you got to research this stuff. You got to think about serial killers all day long you get you set your google alert for i mean I, for for eight years i was writing i wrote on for eight years or seven years and you became the head writer of dexter no i did not become the head writer of okay dexter. but I, you were in yeah. the writing room in dexter on that one i was i was the writing assist the writing assistant right, just, and he, he was like i'm sorry i had to step backwards my agents were sort of like at that point not the same ones i have now but they're like no you can't take a step backwards and i went i connect with this story i connect with the storytelling i'm gonna do it because i I believe in it. And they were like, uh. I have seen this a thousand times. Yeah. Some, when you go back through somebody's story, yeah. there are these key moments when somebody around them was like, no, the rungs on the ladder go up. Yeah. This move, you need to keep going up the rungs. And they're like, no, I'm going the other direction because I believe in this thing. Yes. And I connect with it. And I'd rather yeah. have less money, less prestige, less connections, less. This is so fascinating to me. I always hear this. Somewhere in the story are these key moments. It's if you, uh, yeah, I believe that that's if you want to live your dream or what you know, get close to it anyway. You got to make those decisions that oh, don't make sense. Absolutely, I have yeah. I have hundreds of them I can think of where I was like, <laughs> I know that the conventional wisdom would be r turn right here. Yeah, but I have to go left because my heart and my conscience and my integrity need to go left. Yeah, and this is actually the thing that's interesting to me. Yes, and I don't. Yeah. I'd rather lose doing this than win doing that yes so you go essentially whatever takes that back and you become writer's assist assistant in dexter I'm where all day long you're thinking about serial killers oh yeah i wake up in the morning I, I get my google alert and i look at the are there any new serial killers is that literally <laughs> what you're looking for yeah and current ones that are working now and all the ones that are working in the the pacific north pacific corridor between you know canada oh, and no way oregon and is the writer's room on dexter What's it like to be with a group of people thinking about serial killers all day uh, long? It's, 
it's going to sound terrible, but it's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot. I mean, it's it's a lot of dark humor, and again, it's another show where we're yeah. uh, we're all being very honest and true about what we're going through and our feelings and whatever you know, and and pitching story and uh, and they I was pitching story and on the story was ending up on screen a lot. Um, By the way, maybe editor's note: pitching story would be you're sitting around the table and somebody says, "Okay, what if they go up the mountain and they get some trees and they make a fire?" Someone else says, "What if they build a." Well, right, like yes. pitching is yeah, everybody's yeah. tossing out. This could happen. What about this? What about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. And eventually, what something if it's a flat tire? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something emerges that sort of best idea wins, or something yes. that everybody goes right. That yes. he builds a cabin, and there's a polar bear. There's and a sense of consensus behind yeah. it that people go, "Oh, that's the one. Let's do that." Let's and that, go that just direction. happens. And and your pitching stuff, yeah, that is ending up getting in the script, getting filmed, getting making it into the show. Yes. Yep. Again, so so second season, um, writing assistant again, uh, which is a bummer, but I want you know. Yeah. I love it. I love it so much. And they and with this sort of like slight promise, we'll give you a script if, if things work out, which is crazy because it's only you know fifteen episodes, I think, or whatever. Right. Um. And uh, and so I pitched out something that ended up like sort of being the season story, and. Uh, Clyde and Daniel, the two like co showrunners, or Cl Clyde was the showrunner and Daniel was the number, like the number two. We're both like, let's give him a script. So, got a script and got to write that. And uh, it ended up very being re really fun and exciting. And it got like a, a cat, it got not a cat, what am I saying? It got a Writers Guild nomination. Your for, script. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was awkward and cool, but you know, staff. Guy just got pulled up to staff writer gets this sort of thing, right? Uh, but it was everyone was super happy about that. And then from there, I, I you know just started rising in the ranks in, in the show and and stayed around all the way to the end of season eight. What Which, is it yeah. like when a TV sh when you've been in a writer's room on a TV show for eight years, and then you get to the final season? Yeah. And then you get towards the end, and I assume when you're breaking down the story on the end. Because we all have our favorite shows and we all those last episodes. Yeah. What is it like when you're pitching how to end it and how to? What's that? Oh, it's terrifying. I mean, I imagine you. Is had it this, really terrifying? Oh yeah. I mean, how do you? It's it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how great your flight was if you don't land it right. <laughs> all right. Uh, and people love Dexter. People love Dexter, this but show people was huge. were not. Yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. It was a. It was a juggernaut to a certain extent. Um, how many people watched that show weekly? Uh, I don't know. At this point. I mean, there was it was on Showtime, so it's about a subscriber base. But I think oh. between, I don't know the numbers, but between five and eight million a week or whatever. Five to eight million people. And then, were and then it got on Netflix, and it then got it goes CBS, on Netflix, and, and then it, then just, it just goes round and round, yeah, yeah, yeah. boom, from there. But um, yeah, it was it was uh, we spun a while. I mean, your friend, I, I listened to the one with uh, uh, Carlton Hughes yes. talking about the ending of Lost, of, of Lost, and just how. At a, at a certain point, you just got to sort of got to stick to your guns and and land that plane. <laughs> and is there a day in yeah. the writers' room when that's the last day in the writers' room? Yes, and it's a little sad and uh, a little exciting too. Because I mean, eight years, right? A lot of us. There was like five or six of us that were on it the the whole time. Um, but it was like I'm, you know, I don't know if you saw the ending. A lot, a lot of people really, 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 really hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is tough. Like, and did you listen got, to all that? Did you read I, blogs? Did I you did. care? I did. I did. I did care. Uh, I mean, I got like it's probably one of the only shows where you'll get like a death threat. <laughs> like I got Twitter death threats for like I'm going to put you on a table, Reynolds, for what you did to the. <laughs> to the you show. got <laughs> yeah. death threats for how you ended a fictional show. <laughs> well, but that's the thing. Like when you do a show, when you tell a story, at a certain point, that story. As much as we as writers have an act and the actors and you know everybody involved with this thing have a sense of ownership over it, as a viewer, we get just as much ownership on it too. Oh, you know? man. I mean, the, movie, the, the shows that you love, y you're as invested as the writers were at a certain point. And, right. Yeah. I remember uh, a couple of years ago being at a Christmas party and seeing the actor who played the dad in season five of Friday Night Lights. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had this fantastic conversation, but I, it's all I could do not to be like, man, 
we've been through some stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they were, they were, Friday Night Lights is a prime example. That they were, they were our family. <laughs> it's bizarre oh, how shit. powerfully yeah. these I love that show. shows, stories, characters, you're, yeah. you literally are like, yeah, man, that was something we went through. Yeah. I'm exhausted. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, well, and think about like Michael C. Hall, who is incredible. He's the star of He's Dexter. He's the star of it. He's Dexter. You know, everywhere he goes, he sits in a, he sits in a, uh, in a bar having a drink somewhere and people look at Dexter Morgan sitting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Who's yeah. Who's he hunting? <laughs> I remember you yeah. once said, uh, like maybe season four yeah. was about you, something about how much of it was about being a dad. Yes, season four, season four is, season four, uh, I was dealing with being a, you know, like the kids were getting older and being a father was a bit more uh, hands-on mm -hmm. than, than when they were just babies, you mm -hmm. know, basically I, I'll hold it and feed it, but I'm not <laughs> connecting in the same way all I of a am sudden, this when is they're like... talking back at me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which sounds awful now that I said it out loud, but whatever. I don't care. No, I understand. Uh, but um, we get yeah, that. season four was Dexter deciding, can I have it all? Can I be a father and a serial killer? You know, can I have, and which is what we all deal with at a certain point, right? Like, can I be, a parent and be fully invested with with these this my yeah. spouse and my kids uh and have this career that is powerful and pulling me away toward another life you know um i like how you put it can i be a parent and a serial killer yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. like oh yeah I totally had that question <laughs> yeah. multiple times and, and that was john lithgow who so was how unbelievable so oh, how gosh. do you so when we watch Dexter season four, yeah. there are bits and pieces that are filtered through you and Amy and your family living yes. where you do with the challenges. So when we see shows and we're feeling different things, if you were to trace it back to the show, to the actors, to the script, to the writer's room, to what they had for breakfast and what they're struggling with and their marriages yeah. and their kids, yeah. it all filters in. To yeah. These yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's fascinating. That, That's fascinating to me. Yeah, uh, there's been times when we're watching it. We'd have friends over, we'd all watch it together, and Amy would suddenly look at me like, oh, "That's us." No how, way! How, how dare you share that? And I'm like, nobody knows. But now everybody in this room knows because you're freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> you, Amy would not know. She would not have seen the Dexter episode. She would not have read the script. Right. She would be sitting in your living room watching the episode that you wrote with your friends. Yeah. And real and see something on screen <laughs> yeah. that is directly connected with your life with yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, and it's so personal to her. And she's not; she doesn't like to share like that kind of life. Uh, yeah. And she would look at you like, "What are you? Why like, you what are you that? doing? You airing do our dirty laundry?" It's, and you're like, "Yes, no." <laughs> it's exactly right. And I have to explain to her like, there is this, there is a certain amount in the you know in the writer's room. There is uh, it's like a yeah. holy place kind of. Yeah, it's like a therapist or a confidentiality. Like yes. The code of silence, the ring of silence, or whatever we yeah. call it. Um, and Wait, we you share said, you the said ugly. Sacred. There's something sacred about yeah, this yeah. space. Because we're just all, we, I mean, we're trying to create this story that's hopefully affecting yeah. people and, and entertaining them, to, uh, all, certainly so. But, um, but moving them and making them think about their life. You know, I mean, for me, Dexter's amazing because he, he makes you sort of confront the only. The, uh, what does Richard Rohr say about the shadow self or whatever? Yeah. Like, he makes you confront that because uh, at a certain point, you are like, yeah, Dexter, capture that pedophile, put him on your table, wrap him in plastic, and kill him. Yes. And then you have to look at your soul and go, yeah. Oh, my goodness. What is it within me? I've been me? cheering him on in this, like, in the moment when he actually does the ugly deed and stabs him and then starts, now he's going to chop him up and put him in garbage bags and throw him in the ocean that it just washes over you that like i what part of me is rejoicing in this yes so like we all have the shadow self you dexter is a show about a serial killer which is essentially because everybody's like well you know I, I struggle with this or i do this or these are some <laughs> of my regards but you know it's not like i'm a serial killer yeah, yeah. so you yeah. essentially just make a show <laughs> That is the shadow <laughs> yeah, self, yeah. just writ large. Writ large and big. All of us at some level have this shadow. Just just make it so over the top. Yeah. And then what do you do with that? And what does that pull out of you? And yeah. How does it affect your relationships? I mean, that was season four. How does it, can you actually live, with, live that sort of life and it not drift into your 
children's life than right, into your wife's right, life. Right, and ultimately, right. you know. Which is the ultimate lie yeah. for people who are like, yeah, I know this is pretty bad, but, you know, it's not like it affects my family. And you're like, yeah. You, <laughs> it's gonna. You really don't think it, are you kidding me? Yeah. Of course. You're integrated. Everything in your life is affecting everything in your life. Yeah. yeah this idea yeah, that yeah. you can compartmentalize. So uh, Dexter wraps, Dexter and then wraps. at the end of Dexter, are you already like, I wonder what I'm going to do next? I wonder where I'm going next? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I was. Uh, and then I get this call from Kevin Williamson, uh, or my agents, or I forget how it all worked out. But um, That's a producer? Kevin Williamson is the guy that made another movie that affected me, not quite in the same way that Pulp Fiction did, but um, he made Scream. Did you ever see Scream? Scream? No. You should see Scream. Scream is, it's incredible. It's like the okay. greatest, it's a slasher movie. It's a horror movie. I love horror movies. Ladies and gentlemen, we went from Richard Rohr to Scream <laughs> in about, let me see here, a minute and a half. That's my life, man. It I reminds me. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of something Richard Rohr says about the shadow self. Dude, Scream. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. You got to see Scream. So that guy had made a movie that had affected you. He, lo- yeah. It, it breaks down. It's a, it's like this postmodern take on this on the he breaks down the slasher film completely. Oh, and it's got really it. funny. And yeah, scary. Uh, okay. And he was like, I saw that movie, and I was like, Oh my gosh, this guy gets me. Yeah. Um. And then he, he's doing a show called The Following, which was with Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. So now you are two degrees away, I guess. I don't know. Right. I was just gonna say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, it was season two of The Following, and they were like, Can you want to come over here? And a part of me was like, Do I want to go back? Because it's a it's another serial killer show. Mm-hmm. It's a, they're hunting serial killers, basically. Part of me was like, do I really want to dive back into that? But I want to work with Kevin Williamson, was, was ultimately the So you decision. go and do following for how many seasons? I do that for one season. Um, and it was awesome, and Kevin Bacon is every bit as incredible as everybody says. Really? I mean, everybody, everybody, it was a, it's a wild, chaotic great experience work, working on that show and a guy uh, and an actor like kevin bacon who has done such great work for so many years yeah is just a great human being we call it yeah they, he's he's uh and in, in the tv language he's like a great number one like he he's number one on the call sheet yep and he sets the pace and the stage and the care for everybody uh he's really? not I mean, you know, there's some things you work on that there that people end up uh, people end up being kind of entitled or whatever, and so he was never that way. He was he was he like he he would stick around to the end of the night to read off camera for the actor, Uh, and it's like which is just above and beyond stuff. Yeah, a lot of times it's like at that point, you know, the script supervisor is going to just read for the actor because. We're not on Kevin Bacon anymore, but Kevin yeah. Bacon would stick around till four in the morning Just out in the woods because he's committed to this whole process. And that was a great thing for me to see too, you know, after. Mike Seagal is the same kind of guy, you know. It's, it's, I was, I've been blessed that I've worked with people that are, that, that lead by example. Right. And lead a whole crew by example, you know, Man. which is a great, which is so a inspiring. great thing. Yeah, yeah. And then you wrap up following. So that, that ends. And then at this point, uh, Melissa Rosenberg, who is uh, the writer of the Twilight movies, um, so she's like the, the most successful female screenwriter of all time. That's, that's her. <laughs> that's, that's her. Um, uh, I'd worked with her on Dexter. And when, when I was toward the end of Dexter, ABC called her up and said, you should look into this comic book called Alias. And, I, and this is where we get into the whole Marvel thing, where I am a, along with movies and crime movies and horror movies i am a comic book fan too my poor wife (laughs) i'm like all these things uh it paid off for me which is good but um i love comic books so so there's a comic book called alias about jessica jones and she goes reynolds you read comics tell me about this and i said you have to take this show this is this is everything you want and more she is a female strong female pi with PTSD, who makes all the wrong decisions, <laughs> which what's is, not to like? Yeah, what's not to like? Exactly right. Uh, and so she, she was like, yes, she goes for it. And then it just sort of was going to be on ABC, and it's not quite an ABC show because they just wanted like a, you know, crime of the week sort of thing. And so following was ending season two, and she calls me up. She says, Reynolds, Netflix, Marvel, Jessica Jones, let's go. 
And I said, yes! Are you kidding me? Yes! And so I, I, I got to, I, and where this all comes into, like the dreams come true and all that sort of stuff. When I was a kid, uh, I read all these Marvel books. I, when I still do, I still go to the comic shop like twice a month. I, they have, I have a pull list where they pull all my comic books and I, <laughs> oh, and I, I get in there it. and I find my people and we all talk about stuff we've seen or whatever. But one of, the, one of my favorites was Luke Cage. Um, and we get to introduce, she's, I was like, do we get to introduce Luke Cage on this show? And she's like, we get to introduce Luke Cage. And I... You're just, this is the... This I is couldn't like, believe it. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It was So remarkable. you put together, how many seasons of Jessica Jones? Well, just the first season. Yep. Um, yeah. And this and is it, like unbelievable for you. It is... Did un- you build a writer's room then? Yeah, yeah. We, had, we, we set up, we, we All that. built up a, a writer's room because Melissa Rose- Rosenberg was the uh, showrunner. Mm-hmm. Um, and we built up this room and created this story that uh, affected people in ways that we didn't, we weren't even ready for. Um, oh, it, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for us, at no point were we thinking we're making an important statement about women in society and women with PTSD. You and didn't p- have male those power discussions structure. in the writers' room. No, but culturally, when the show hit Netflix. Yes. and people could see it, what people got out of it was way farther down the road than you would imagine. Yes. Were you all in the writer's room going, can you believe well, that's the weird what thing this about, show is doing? Well, this, we, we, didn't, we don't get to see it because unlike network shows, oh, it all, get released, it, it it all gets released at the same time. Right, so we're sort of creating in a vacuum. Like we, we broke the first, we figured out, broke, we figured out the first like four or five episodes before we even knew who the cast was going to be. Oh, wow. So we didn't know Christian Ritter was going to be Jessica Jones. We hoped she would be. We all wanted her to be. Yeah. Like she, she, felt, she felt like she was the one. And, and so, she was. so oftentimes when, you're, when people are making a show and they're breaking down story, you're tossing around names of actors and yeah. actresses who you're like, oh, this would be perfect for so-and-so. Yeah. But then sometimes you actually get that Actress. Every once in a while, you actually it actually happens, which yeah. must be unbelievably exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said yes. She connected to it. <sighs> we connected to her performance. I mean, it was everything was great. And the guy playing Kilgrave, David Tennant, like I got to work with Doctor Who. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's interesting <laughs> to me is you you've now been at this and made some really really big shows, but you have a, a an a wide eyed uh, joy about this. I do. That's one of the things. It's uh, it's what it's, it's. Everybody talks about. I don't quite see it. I, I feel like I'm a. I'm not as optimistic as people maybe as they say I am. But mm-hmm. I get told all the time that that it's that. Like I I come to work excited. I come to work. I can't believe. I can't believe I get to talk about. I get to. I get to talk about Luke Cage and Jessica Jones all day today and Kilgrave. What? Are you kidding me, guys? <laughs> How often do you think about seven years in a bookstore? I think I am. I think about that a lot too. I think about that was part of this this journey, and that was probably just as important for me. I think that was important for me because it put inside of me this sense of, of work ethic of giving everything that you got for wherever a job, you're at, wherever you're at, and this sort of like sense of purpose and mission, I guess, that, that I think we all need mm-hmm. uh, of trying to be, like I grew, I grew up super duper Christian, probably more than you, I bet, even. Like, <laughs> super duper Christian. I grew up like That's I was funny. the guy that walked up to people's, in high school, would knock on total strangers' doors and say, if you were to die tonight, excuse me, sir, I've come to your house to ask you, if you were to die tonight. Oh, wow. That's like, God, real, that's hardcore. That's hardcore. Continued witness training. Like I was... I was that super judgmental, but very concerned. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, sure. Of uh, course. Human being um, who only listened to Christian rock. I mean, I was, I was like really <laughs> awesome and strange and weird. And I look back <laughs> on it with a sense of <laughs> dread, but understanding, because it's part of the journey. It's part of understanding. You've made peace with all that. I've made peace with it. Yeah. Um, but, but all that to say, like, I guess what it gave me was this sense of, like, a purpose of how can I be the proof of God in 
much simpler ways. Not in a, if you were to die tonight. Yes. But right. in a, hey, the water jug is empty. I'm going to fill it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, like, and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, and and that gave that. me a sense of purpose because then people would be like, what are you doing that for? Yeah. Well, because it was empty and we, we were thirsty and why wouldn't we do that? Yeah. And, then people, you know, and that kind of sense of optimism and whatever. And every show I work on, uh, they all react, and it's funny to me, but they all react uh, as if I'm this optimistic, happy, I can't, reminding everybody of this, we are living out our dreams, guys. Can you believe we get to do this? We get to talk yeah. about this every day? Um, and hopefully it's not annoying. Oh. For some people it might be, I don't yes. know. But it's, it's funny too, it's like then in my like church or whatever, I'm looked at as the, as the uh, pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Reynolds. I get that. Serial killers and... <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Looked down really... on and all, you know. Oh, really? How can you do this? Like all, all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, it's... What's the name of your new book? Uh, I'm not plugging it for you, but where you are. Be, uh, How to be here. How to be here. Like that's, that's so important. Like when I, when I read that book, it like... It validates everything that I mm. really try to do wow. to have a sense of the now and anything can happen in the now. And if you are, if you are in touch with that, um, incredible things beyond oh, could so, happen. So true. You know, because I, I got to work yeah. on Jessica Jones. I got to introduce Luke Cage, Mike Coulter. I got to hang out on set with Luke Cage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I got to I watch him. I, I got to, uh, on the episodes that I was on set for in New York, I got to watch Jessica Jones and Luke Cage fight. I, I, superheroes fighting each other. I, I got to, and this is cut to 10 year old Scott Reynolds, who was reading those comic books again and again and dreaming of these things. Uh, so, anyway, so Jessica Jones raps, it really affects people in a way. You know, I, I got to write this episode that is about rape and uh, where she really confronts, where Jessica confronts this man that did terrible, horrible, no good, very bad things to her. And uh, even now when I go to like Writers Guild, you know, speaking things or whatever, people walk up to me and, and these women walk up to me and just like this moved, this mm. opened up my life, this... It helped me wow. look at my life in a different way. It helped me deal with my own PTSD. It gave me strength. Um, but, but the truth is, I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff when we were writing it in the room. We were just trying to tell a compelling story uh, that entertains people. That's the, the and truth. And it moves people like that. But it can move them. If you, if you really... Uh, there, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's, nothing, there's, there's nothing wrong. It's that whole thing, you know... Jesus in his parables, like, how many of those people really understood what he was talking about? <laughs> like, even his own guys were like, uh, well, what, he even, what's this about bread? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he, even there are these moments, like, the ones who have ears to hear. Yeah. Like, I'm going to say some things. Some people are going to hear it. Some people aren't. Some people are just going to be entertained. And, yeah. And some I mean, it's a little weirder, like, with Dexter, because, like, <laughs> there were, there, you know, there were, there were people that maybe might have copycatted him. That's a that's a weird oh, thing. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, um, that gets a little more serious, a little more heavy quickly. Yeah, but but ultimately, the story we were telling was, I, I feel, uh, in a way, you know, like Breaking Bad is wa watching Walter White, all of the evil in his heart, sort of become real, manifesting, manifesting yeah. itself, and it's a beautiful, amazing story, um, powerful. Uh, Dexter was a little different. Here's this person who's becoming, who's suddenly looking at his life and going, whoa, maybe there mm -hmm. is, maybe I need to get away from everybody because I am a monster. Mm -hmm. But then the thing is, the minute you realize you're a monster, you're really not a monster anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Real monsters have no yeah, idea. you shine the light in those places and suddenly there's less darkness. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And then, and... Um, so from, yeah. And now you're on to new things, on which another, at some yeah, point... another, yeah, a new Marvel show. That I wish I could tell you, but I'm not supposed to. But again, it's it is, it is a child. It's a it's a comic that I read when I was a kid. Oh, uh, incredible! That I that I get to tell these that stories. Now it's about. your job to take that thing you read as a kid and make it, put yeah. it out. 
Yeah. Oh man. And every day I'm just, I really, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't believe I get to do this. Oh, yeah. it's so inspiring. <laughs> it's so All inspiring. Of, and it's interesting <laughs> to me just going back through these key moments when you're like, the life is in this direction. And if I don't go in this direction. Yeah. For something else that, that yeah. could be great also, but it isn't, it doesn't speak to me in the way that yeah. these stories do that are adventures writ bold and large and big and the, you know, the stakes are high, whether it's Dexter Morgan dealing with his shadow self, which happens to be a serial killer or, you know, <laughs> to, to Jessica Jones, who basically feels like she's a piece of garbage. Mm. And that's something we all, I mean, I struggle yeah. with that, Yeah, uh, that I'm not good enough. Um, and here's someone that uh, keeps taking another step forward and stumbles backwards and falls over drunk and throws somebody on the subway that they shouldn't have, you know, it does, yeah. does terrible bad things, but over, but her heart is her unreliable narrator within the side of her is pushing her forward into trying to be the good person that she wants to be. Um, Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. Thank you so much for coming to the back house. Yeah, man. Thanks. This is Thank really you you inspiring. Uh, I mean, Look, I'm, uh, 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 <laughs> Love Wins uh, pulled me back into wow. the, the, the stratosphere of there is a loving God that loves oh, us all. Oh, wow. Um, That's at amazing. At a point when I was, at a point when I was uh, thinking it's just religion and dumb, <laughs> hmm. you know? So wow. a lot of what I write is uh, influenced by what you write, oh, which is man. great. So thank you. Seriously. For uh, Love Wins. You're like making me choke up here. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Grace and peace, everyone. <laughs>